Welcome to this component-free screencast on new right theories of social inequality. Now from the 1980s onwards, a new approach to politics and economics emerged in Britain uh, under uh, Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government and the United States of America under Ronald Reagan's Republican government, which was often referred to as neoliberalism or the new right. And this approach was a revival of 19th century classical liberalism which believed that the economic system worked best when it was based on a free market. And this term free market in this particular context refers to a version of capitalism in which government interference is minimised and all activity is governed only by the laws of supply and demand. Now the basic idea of the new right is that individuals are rational. Individuals know their own interests better than anybody else and therefore as far as is possible they should be responsible for their own life and according to this perspective the government or the state should play a minimal role in the running of society. In fact from this perspective state or government interference they would argue is the cause of social problems. We see this argument in relation to welfare benefits later on in the screencast. So in a nutshell, the new right or neoliberalism argues that the state, that refers to the government, that does least is best. So from this perspective, both individuals and businesses work best uh, when the government doesn't intervene very much uh, in their activities. And that means in practice the new right advocate policies uh, such as the deregulation of business and industry, uh, the lowering of taxes, uh, privatisation and reductions to public spending including reductions to spending on welfare. Now new right ideas have generally not been popular with most sociologists partly because they emphasise the importance of the individual and free choice, whereas most sociologists, by contrast, tend to see individuals as always operating in a social context. Nevertheless, I think there are parallels to functionalism. So in many respects, new right views on inequality are similar to functionalism in that they believe that inequality can be very useful for society. For example, the new right sociologist Peter Saunders argues that uh, economies that have large uh, inequalities are actually very competitive, uh, very dynamic, and that this tends to lead to more economic growth that actually raises living standards for the majority of people within society. So for Peter Saunders, there is an acceptable trade-off between social inequality and economic growth. However, unlike functionalists, Saunders doesn't see stratification as being an inevitable part of all societies. So he argues that a society based on social equality would be possible, but it would only be possible if considerable force were used. So the threat of death, the threat of imprisonment, various forms of coercion, because he argues that that coercive power would be necessary to make sure that everybody did jobs to the best of their abilities because in a society with no inequality uh, people would not be motivated by intrinsic economic rewards so you would need to force them uh, to work harder. And therefore Saunders like other new right thinkers are very critical of the idea that governments should be pursuing equality of outcome as a political goal. For new right thinkers, this is actually the road to totalitarianism and uh, undermining uh, individual freedom or liberty. Now, in relation to the wealthy and social inequality, uh, the new right approach uh, is linked to an economic idea known as trickle-down theory. And the belief of this perspective is that if the wealthy pay less tax and are allowed to make more profit, uh, the money that they spend will help to stimulate the economy, 
will allow them to create more jobs and that eventually everybody will benefit. So from this perspective, in order to raise living standards for everybody, you've got to look after the rich. And this particular idea inspired Margaret Thatcher's Conservative governments to uh, slash the top rate of income tax from 83% to 60% in 1979 and then to 40% by 1988. Now in contrast to their attitudes towards the rich, uh, the new right tend to take a much more punitive approach when explaining the plight of the poor. And this approach is sometimes referred to as underclass theory and it's based on two ideas about the poorest sections of society who are referred to as an underclass. So the first idea is this idea of cultural deprivation. So this is the idea that the poor have a deficient culture that uh, acts as a barrier to success. And then linked to that, we have this idea of a cycle of deprivation, which suggests that the poor transmit poverty to their children, so to successive generations, through poor, inadequate socialisation. The American sociologist Charles Murray is probably the theorist most associated with underclass theory. After a visit to Britain, he claimed that within the UK, a culture of welfare dependence had developed in a similar way to the United States of America. And he believed that certain types of people, whom he defined as an underclass, were simply unwilling to work because they'd become over-reliant and very dependent on state benefits to support themselves. And he argued that a vicious cycle uh, exists within this dependency culture, that uh, illegitimate children with no male role models, um, subsisting on welfare benefits and badly socialised by uneducated young single mothers, were actually creating generations of children just like themselves. And in his view, this was leading to an increase in crime and violence in society. So he claimed controversially that an entire class of people were becoming dependent on welfare benefits and excluded socially from job opportunities and political life. Now the new right claimed that their views on poverty and welfare are supported by the public. And it certainly seems to be true that we've seen a hardening of public attitudes towards welfare benefits and the poor. For example, if we look at the British Social Attitudes Survey, uh, recently it reported that 62% of respondents now agree that unemployment benefits are too high and discourage work, and that's more than double the proportion who thought this in 1991. So certainly we seem to be seeing a shift in public opinion um, in favour of more punitive uh, new right policies towards welfare and poverty. However, many sociologists would argue that this is largely based not on facts about welfare, but it's largely due to the bias and distorted media coverage of poverty, of welfare benefits that you find in certain sections of the media. For example, right-wing tabloid newspapers such as the Daily Mail tend to seek out uh, unsympathetic, uh, atypical uh, cases of poor people on benefits and then portray them as if somehow they were the norm. In contrast, the reality is that most welfare claimants are actually working, but they're often uh, in jobs uh, that pay them less than the living wage and therefore require uh, benefits to top up their meagre incomes. And the criminal connotations that are attached uh, to the so-called underclass are not helped by media representations such as the one that you can see on the screen at the moment. Disgracefully, uh, this particular image uh, was used uh, by the BBC News when they were discussing government plans to introduce a benefits cap. And, and clearly this image has connotations of a criminal, deviant, um, 
dysfunctional underclass, which is not a fair and objective representation of poor people uh, in receipt of state benefits. So most sociologists would argue that the new right policies that have been implemented by uh, British and American governments over the past 30 years have not improved the lives of the poorest in society. In fact, one could argue that the atmosphere of hostility directed towards those on benefits has also resulted in the sick and disabled uh, being penalised and increasingly victimised and stigmatised by others in society and by the benefit system. And these types of issues are explored in the recent Ken Loach film, uh, I, Daniel Blake. So there's a powerful argument to suggest that the new right are actually blaming the victims of social deprivation and inequality for their own misfortunes. And in relation to public opinion, one of the things that is noted by Wilson and Pickett uh, in their book The Spirit Level is that as societies become more unequal, there tends to be less sympathy in terms of public opinion uh, about the people at the bottom of society. Instead, we tend to get harsher, more punitive uh, discourses uh, about the poor as inequality grows. Finally, in relation to New Right views on the wealthy and the trickle-down theory that we discussed earlier in the screencast, many sociologists and economists would argue that there's very little empirical evidence to back up the so-called trickle-down effect. For example, the economist Harjun Chang argues that the trickle-down argument, crucially, depends on the assumption that when they're given a bigger slice of national income, the rich will use it to increase investments. And he argues that this is an assumption that has simply not been borne out by reality that the reality is that the rich tend to save more of their disposable income, uh, often offshore, in tax havens, and economic growth actually slows down. Uh, in contrast to the trickle-down effect, Harjun Chang proposes higher wages for ordinary workers and higher rates of tax on the super-rich and large corporations, as well as a coordinated international closure of tax loopholes.